Really would like my old life back where I could walk the streets like a normal person. They're saying that I took a gun, put it up, and killed another human being. No, I'm not the one that shot him. I wouldn't hurt. Then who did, Dee Dee? Tell us. Abraham Lee Shakespeare was born in 1966 in Florida. He had a difficult start to his life, dropping out of school after the seventh grade and unable to read or write. He spent time in juvenile prisons for various burglaries but soon started working odd labouring jobs to support himself. His mother Elizabeth, whom he was very close to, said he was a hard worker and always made sure he was employed in some way. Abraham had his first child with his on-again, off-again partner, Antoinette, and his baby boy was named Moses. Abraham adored Moses, and although he and Antoinette would eventually part ways, Abraham made sure he saw Moses as much as he possibly could. In November 2006, Abraham was working as a truck driver's assistant for a food delivery company. On November 15th, during an overnight delivery trip, he and his colleague Michael Ford were making their way to Miami. They made a stop at a local Townstar convenience store in Frostproof. Michael wanted cigarettes and drinks and asked Abraham if he wanted anything. Abraham asked Michael to buy him two lottery tickets. He only had $5 on him and bought two for $2 each. Little did he know, he had just purchased the Florida Lotto winning ticket worth $30 million and his life had just changed forever. He had gone from scraping by on odd jobs to being a multimillionaire, never having to work a day in his life again. But less than three years later, the money would be gone, and Abraham Shakespeare would be a missing man. When it comes to accepting lottery winnings, you can either choose to get the money paid to you in annual instalments, or you can take a one-time lump sum payment. Abraham Shakespeare chose to take the lump cash sum of 17 million before tax. In January 2007, he purchased a beautiful home in a gated community in Florida for $1.1 million. He also put $1 million into a trust fund for his son. But after this, he wouldn't really make any other large purchases for himself, instead choosing to gift or loan the money to other people. Later, in April 2007, Abraham was approached by his old truck driving colleague, Michael Ford, Michael demanded a share of the money on the basis that he had been the one to purchase the tickets for him. He refused to pay, resulting in Michael suing Abraham. Michael then alleged it was in fact him who had bought the ticket for himself and then kept them in his wallet and Abraham had stolen them. However, the jury did not believe the story and in October 2007, after just an hour of deliberation, they ruled that Abraham had not stolen the tickets and Michael Ford received nothing. Abraham had become somewhat of a local celebrity off of the back of his lottery win, and it wasn't long before people wanted a piece of his new lifestyle. Abraham was described as someone who thought with his heart rather than his head, and, as a result, was incredibly generous with his substantial fortune. He paid off people's mortgages, gave people huge loans and gifts, and paid for medical bills and funerals. Abraham was kind and giving, not just with those close to him, but with strangers too. He also returned the favour to people that had helped him when he was struggling for money. But people said he soon grew tired and frustrated with the appeals for money from everyone. I really would like my old life back where I could walk the streets like a normal person, but got people coming up asking for money. Friends and family, hangers-on and total strangers would all call and write to him, constantly asking for all manner of financial help. The mother of Abraham's second son, Jeremiah, was a lady named Centuria. She said that even prison inmates sent him letters asking for money. Her brother said that he had spent the morning with Abraham and that his phone had rang eight times during the half an hour. All of these calls were from people asking for something. In November 2009, Cedric Edam, Abraham's cousin, phoned the Polk County Sheriff's Office to report him as missing. Abraham's friends and family said they hadn't heard anything from him since April, seven months ago. 
They wondered if he had perhaps taken his winnings and moved somewhere to start a new life. Others believed he had grown tired of people entering his life purely for the purpose of getting money, and he had stepped away from the public eye to protect himself. The spotlight he had suddenly been thrust into had ultimately taken a toll on him, and this theory didn't seem impossible. But Abraham's mother Elizabeth said he would never have left without telling her seven months was a long time to go with no contact and the police immediately began an investigation. One of the people that had come into his life after his big win was a woman named Doris Stonegan Moore, known to everyone as Dee Dee Moore. A lot of people in Abraham's life had mentioned Dee Dee's name as someone that might be able to offer more information. Dee Dee had previously worked as a nursing assistant before moving into the offices of a healthcare company. As well as this, she had other side businesses she was pursuing. She alleged that she was making around $10,000 a month from selling Nextel prepaid phones and was also making an extra $30,000 a year by selling Mary Kay products. But Dee Dee was spending the money faster than she was getting it and she was in debt with credit cards and on car and house leases too. Dee Dee Moore's relationship with Abraham Shakespeare began when she started talking to Abraham's real estate agent, Barbara, about a new book she was working on. It was a story about rags to riches, and Barbara suggested she meet and talk to Abraham. However, when she met him, Dee Dee said it was clear that he didn't need a book writing on him. He needed someone to help him organise his finances. Although Abraham had been a multimillionaire just several months prior, he actually had little left, as most of it had been given away. Dee Dee wanted to act as a financial advisor to Abraham and help him start a business to manage his money. The pair set one up in Abraham's name, with Dee Dee in control of the funds. Dee Dee began her new business venture by giving herself a cool $1 million, buying several cars, expensive jewellery and going on a lavish holiday. She said this money was a gift from Abraham as a thank you for helping him, but over the next few months Abraham's money began to dwindle even more. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were now being shifted around into various accounts, including Dee Dee's business account for her own company, American Medical Professionals. At the end of February 2009, the balance of Abraham Shakespeare LLC Bank of America account stood at just over $44,000. Dee Dee seemed more than happy to help the authorities and told them, as well as Abraham's friends and family, that Abraham had grown so tired of people asking for money, he just wanted to disappear and at his request, she helped him do just that. But while Abraham was missing, Dee Dee moved into his house. She said she had purchased the home from him for $655,000, which was all part of an elaborate scheme that she and Abraham had. She also told authorities that he had transferred most of his money and assets over to her before he left town, but no receipts were found to back this up, and police immediately became even more suspicious of her. They asked Dee Dee if she could get in touch with him, she said although she had been messaging him frequently, she couldn't reveal where he was hiding. Police decided to look into Dee Dee Moore's background, along with her computer and both hers and Abraham's bank accounts. This began the start of a lengthy and complex investigation. Dee Dee had a very checkered past, having been convicted of multiple crimes including insurance fraud, falsely reporting a crime, shoplifting and writing bad checks. She had once taken out a loan to buy a new Lincoln Navigator, a loan which she soon realised she couldn't make the repayments on. When the vehicle became close to being repossessed, to get out of making payments, she staged a particularly shocking scene. She hid the car in a garage and reported that she had been kidnapped and sexually assaulted before the perpetrators stole her car. Investigators claimed she had taped her own wrists and threw herself out of a moving vehicle to embellish the story. She even went as far as to take a rape test kit. She eventually pled no contest and received probation. Further down the line, she was accused of stealing tens of thousands of dollars from people with the intention of helping them set businesses up, only to leave with the money and never contact them again. During the months Abraham had been missing, his friends and family had been receiving text messages from him. Although this would normally be a positive sign, it was actually a massive red flag as Abraham never texted. He was illiterate and texting was just not something he was able to do. Instead, he spent all of his time calling people. Analysis of Abraham's phone records showed he was taking and making calls consistently throughout each day. But on April 6th, 
all of these calls stopped, and they were replaced by the odd text here and there. It was becoming more and more obvious that something had happened to him in early April. In late December 2009, Dee Dee took Abraham's mother Elizabeth out to dinner. Dee Dee had recently bought Elizabeth a prepaid phone, and while at the restaurant, Elizabeth received a phone call from a private number. On the end of the line was someone claiming to be her son. She immediately contacted the police, who took less than 24 hours to work out the phone's number and GPS location. When the police tracked it down, it appeared to be sat stationary in Lakeland Mall. As soon as the officers pulled into the parking lot, they spotted Dee Dee Moore's car. She was pulled up alongside another car and handed something to the man in the driver's seat. As soon as she drove off, officers surrounded the vehicle. They saw that it wasn't Abraham Shakespeare at all. It was a man named Greg Smith. Greg was an old friend of Abraham's. He owned a barber shop and Abraham used to do odd jobs for him. After winning the lottery, Abraham had given Greg a loan of just over $60,000 to help Greg's mother pay for her house when it went into default. Greg was paying this back in monthly instalments. When the police asked Greg what was going on, he said Dee Dee had handed him $300 in exchange for phoning Elizabeth, posing as Abraham. But Greg, along with many of the people that Dee Dee had spoken to, believed that Abraham was in hiding and didn't want to be found. He felt he was helping Abraham stay safe and under the radar and wanted to stop Elizabeth from worrying. When police told Greg that they believed Abraham was not safe and well, and they suspected Dee Dee knew more than she was letting on, Greg was shocked. He agreed to help the police and pass information on to them. Greg fit a hidden wire into a Red Bull can and took it along to every encounter he had with Dee Dee. Although Greg's actions were initially suspicious, police knew that he too had been a victim of Dee Dee Moore's manipulation. I only been talking to you because I'm trying to find Abraham. Exactly. Well, hey, I'm all in, baby. I feel like if Abraham was okay, he would contact me by now because he he transferred all that stuff into my name and then he was supposed to leave and, you know, not come back for a while. While under surveillance, Dee Dee asked Greg to deliver a handwritten letter to Elizabeth. This was going to be a fake letter from Abraham and would be another attempt to stop people looking for him. But Abraham couldn't read and couldn't write, and this would have ultimately drawn more attention to Dee Dee if Elizabeth ever got hold of the letter. Fortunately, it was intercepted by the police via Greg before Elizabeth could read it. As well as Greg Smith, Dee Dee had offered Centoria Butler a $200,000 house if she agreed to lie and say that Abraham had visited her one night. She also paid Abraham's cousin $5,000 to deliver a card to his mother, saying that too was from Abraham. Police knew the answer to what had happened to Abraham lay with Dee Dee Moore, and the evidence against her was rapidly starting to mount. Dee Dee was now panicking and decided to show the media a video that she had filmed of Abraham, which allegedly added weight to her story that he had run away and left his old life behind. You get tired of people asking you for money all the time, Abe? Give me your opinion on it. I've been to a year ago. You just ready to start living your life, huh? They don't take no for a house or so. So where do you want to go to? It don't matter to me. I'm not a picky person. Well, how do you like, how do you like, your, are you going to miss your home? Yep, I miss it, but life goes on. A lady named Judith was a long-time friend of Abraham and someone that had become a business associate of Dee Dee. She revealed that Abraham had raised concerns with her about his finances and he wanted to look into them at the bank. When she told Dee Dee about these concerns, Dee Dee told her to stop him getting into the bank as a lot of the money was no longer in the account. This allegedly happened in March of 2009, just one month before Abraham disappeared. On the 13th of January 2010, Grady Judd told the public that the police believed Abraham had been the victim of a crime, and just a day before the conference, Grady Judd named Dee Dee Moore as a person of interest. It appears, and I'm very cautious, that Abraham Shakespeare is broke. We certainly hope 
that the confidence act that D.D. Moore is involved in to make it appear that Abraham Shakespeare has disappeared with money is correct and he's alive and well. But our investigation doesn't lead us to believe that at this time. Several days after this announcement, Dee Dee responded, just as they'd hoped. She contacted Greg Smith again and asked him if he knew anyone that would be willing to take the rap and say they killed Abraham Shakespeare. When Greg told the police about this conversation, they instructed him to call her straight back with a fake story about a relative who was about to undertake a 20-year sentence for drug charges and that he might be someone to talk to. Dee Dee hastily agreed to talk to him and the meeting was set for January 21st, 2010. But of course, there was no relative and the man Dee Dee was actually meeting was an undercover police officer called Mike. Dee Dee told Mike that she did in fact feel Abraham was dead, but if he was, she had nothing to do with it. Mike said he needed more details if he was going to take the rap for a crime he didn't commit. He wanted to know where Abraham was, what the murder weapon had been, and where this had all happened. Dee Dee said she would see what she could find out and offered him $50,000 to falsely admit to the crime. Then, what do you want? 50 grand. Can I do it in payments? Because I don't have that kind of cash. I'm going to have to sell something. I'm going to need 10 up front. Once I, once I do this, mm -hmm. make sure my boy get the money. Dee Dee met with Greg Smith again. She handed him a 38 caliber pistol. It was registered in her name and was the gun that was allegedly used in the murder. She then drove Greg out to a house in Plant City. It was a house that she had purchased with Abraham's money and Dee Dee's boyfriend, Shah Krasnicki, was living in it. She walked over to a concrete slab outside and indicated this was where Abraham's body had been buried. She had bought a cattle trough with her and said they needed to pour kerosene into it to burn Abraham's remains. She joked that Greg should bring marshmallows along for when he did this. Greg went straight to the police and less than a day later, a team of officers were at the property digging it up. Our deputies gathered information recently that led us to believe that Abraham Shakespeare may very well be buried on this property. After 48 hours of excavation, police finally found the remains of Abraham Shakespeare. He had been buried almost nine foot deep under a 30 foot by 30 foot concrete slab. It was determined that he had been shot twice in the chest. He was missing his shoes and any bits of metal from his jacket and jeans had been cut out or removed. Following this discovery, Dee Dee phoned investigators herself and said she wanted to come in and talk to them. Still denying any wrongdoing, Dee Dee said she was finally ready to tell them exactly what had happened. She claimed that the killer's name was Ronald and he told her where Abraham was buried. You know I'm not the one that shot him. I wouldn't hurt him. Then who did, Dee Dee? Tell us. You were able to contact Ronald and Ronald told you right where that body was at. Really? But you can't get a hold of Ronald, but you got a hold of Ronald then. Come on. It's over. I told him I had to Dee -dee. meet him back later to make sure. Dee -dee. There's no Ronald. She said that Abraham had been involved in a big drug deal gone wrong and that she had watched him get shot while drug dealers cleared out a safe of money. She claimed they decided to leave her alive so that she could continue to give the money down the line. I guarantee you, Ronald has killed him. I just know it because the man threatened to kill my son. I don't even know Ronald's last name. But Ronald was a character that she had fabricated while talking to Greg Smith, while she was unknowingly under surveillance and being recorded. She had seemingly forgotten her own lies. Investigators didn't believe a word and asked Dee Dee to leave the station. Over the next few hours, the Polk and Hillsborough County authorities worked hard to secure an arrest warrant. Alongside all the witnesses that could attest to being bribed and lied to by Dee Dee, analysis of phone records added further weight to their case. When police had looked into Dee Dee's phone data, it confirmed what they were already suspicious of. Whenever she and Abraham would text each other, both phones would ping off of the same cell phone tower, 
indicating that she had his phone. On January 28, 2010, James Moore, Dee Dee's ex-husband, was interviewed. He said that Dee Dee had called him in the first two weeks of April 2009, asking him if he could dig a hole in her yard. She said she needed the hole to bury trash in. He claimed he dug the hole and left the property, only to return two hours later when Dee Dee said she needed him to fill the hole back up. He said it was too dark by this point to see anything that was inside, but he covered it up at her request. From this, the cell phone record analysis and the fact that no one had seen or heard from him since April, it is believed that Dee Dee Moore killed Abraham Shakespeare on the 6th or 7th of April 2009. While the police were working hard on the case, Dee Dee was working hard on clearing her name and telling anyone that would listen she had nothing to do with the murder of Abraham Shakespeare. Because the media will not leave and this is an intrusion on all my neighbours and they don't deserve any of this. They're saying that I took a gun, put it up and killed another human being and it would never, ever ever do that. The situation and how it went down, I wouldn't believe myself. I would say, lock her up. I would, because, but there's always two sides to every story. There's always more to any situation. God up above knows I didn't shoot that man, and that is the only person I have to answer to. Dee Dee changed her story so many times, she couldn't keep up with her own lies, and lost track of the countless versions of events she had told. She said everything from he ran away with a fake passport to start a new life and avoid paying child support, to he was dying of AIDS, to there was a video of him with an underage girl circulating and he had to lay low to avoid being arrested. Do I think that you're a cold-blooded killer? No, I, I hope you're not a cold-blooded killer. I have not killed him. I hope he's not even dead. He's not. Because he wanted to pretend that he was dying of AIDS so that he doesn't have to pay child support and people won't look for him if he's dying of AIDS. What? It was a videotape of him having sex with a 14-year-old girl. My family's being affected. My mom's got heart problems. She's over my house right now cleaning for Thanksgiving. They were, my own parents were scared to come to my house for Thanksgiving. Why? Because of all this stuff happening. Well, how do they know about all this stuff? Because I'm, I'm honest with my family. I honestly can't look at you and believe a word that's come out of your mouth. I you have, have no lied heart. and lied and lied. Dee Dee even went as far to say that her own 14-year-old son killed Abraham, but police never believed a word of any story she told, and the more Dee Dee talked, the more far-fetched her stories became. These impassioned interviews and pleas of innocence did nothing to help with the now overwhelming amount of evidence against her. On February 19, 2010, Dee Dee Moore was formally charged with murder, and she pled not guilty. Three years after Abraham had last been seen, Dee Dee appeared in Hillsborough County Court to stand trial. She claimed she wanted to take to the stand and tell her side of the story, but her lawyers felt it was not a wise decision. Her lawyers said that it was entirely her decision to not take the stand. Throughout the trial, Dee Dee was very animated, often sobbing hysterically, laughing or making outbursts at her lawyers. Although court officials turned off the microphones, Judge Emmett Battles frequently had to stop the court proceedings to address Dee Dee directly and tell her to be quiet. On multiple occasions, Dee Dee was caught pulling faces or blurting out statements at the jury, for which she was reprimanded. I had an anaphylactic shock because they, uh, they gave me a medicine called Bactrim for a kidney infection and it, I was allergic to it, so I had an allergic reaction to it. My tongue swelled up really bad last night. The bottom line is that you, you've received uh, the medical care you need yeah. and in fact, Dr. Weaver is uh, uh, going out of her way, which is appropriate to come here and make sure that you, yeah. uh, she's going to spend a few minutes with you, make sure everything's okay. One other option uh, has to do with a, a type of leg restraint uh, that is uh, essentially a, uh, a bar on the leg. Ms. Moore, I've cautioned you throughout these proceedings that any gestures, facial expressions, audible comments showing approval or disapproval are not acceptable. I'm guilty by sitting there looking down Ma'am, okay. I'm going to explain for the last time, we are not going to bandy about these things. I'm telling you not to do it. Witness after witness came forward. 
Dee Dee Moore arriving for court in a yellow blouse and armed with a pad and pen. She took copious notes as prosecutor Jay Pruner took over an hour detailing the case against her, including a string of stories she told investigators in both Polk and Hillsborough counties as they tried to figure out what happened to lotto winner Abraham Shakespeare. Within 60 days of having been divested of everything he owns to Dee Dee Moore, all that's left of Abraham Shakespeare is his decaying body in a grave under a concrete slab behind a house that she bought on Highway 60 near Plant City. And all of a sudden she said, and when he died, so I looked over at her, I said, well, what you mean when he died? Because she wanted to know about all of his assets, and she was like, I can help you clean him out. Yes, your okay. client used a lot of coercion to make up a big, fat fib. This, this was the sketch that she made. A digging down three foot and in, and I would see a white substance that was in the ground. And once I get to the white substance in the ground, I would see his body. And it was, the plan was she wanted me to burn the body. Do you recall ever seeing this firearm, sir? Yes. And where was it that you saw this firearm? In the safe. I received a phone call from Diddy Moore. She woke, called me and she woke me up. She said, hey, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay, what? She said, I really need to tell you Abraham is dead. Did you pay attention to what was in the hole no, before sir. you filled it? No, sir. Okay, did you see any debris in there, do you recall? I, as far as I remember, there was, but I'm not positive. Okay, did you see? recall seeing a body in there? No, sir. She wanted me to call Abraham's mother and tell Abraham's mother that I was him. Investigating officer David Clark told the courtroom that Dee Dee Moore had even made sexual advances towards him. He said, my son RJ shot Abraham twice. Abraham was trying to choke me. RJ walked in the room, grabbed my gun and shot him. He was only protecting me like any son would do. She actually came toward me and she said that I wasn't gonna get angry, that I was gonna have sex with her. She said she was very attracted to me and hoped once her name was clear that I would pursue a relationship with her. It was also revealed that Dee Dee had phoned her ailing father, hoping he would take the rap for her. Donegan told investigators Dee Dee asked for his help. Quote, she said, well, you're old, you're getting old and all this stuff. The investigator asked, okay, so basically she was just asking if you would take her place in all this? Donegan replied, basically. The prosecution showed a Walmart surveillance video that said further linked Dee Dee to the crime. The footage showed Dee Dee making a $104 cash purchase of gloves, duct tape, plastic sheeting and other items found close to where Abraham's body was buried. On December 10th, 2012, after just three hours of deliberation, the jury had reached their verdict. State of Florida versus Doris Donegan Moore. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Dee Dee Moore simply shook her head no, while her victim's family nodded yes. She had everything she wanted and she still didn't have enough and she took his life. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She also received an additional minimum sentence of 25 years for possessing a firearm. Judge Emmett Battles said, cold, calculated, cruel, they all apply. He said she was probably the most manipulative person that this courtroom has seen. Abraham Shakespeare was your prey and your victim. Money was the root of all evil you brought to Abraham. Dee Dee was absolutely furious with her attorneys and said that if they had allowed her to take the stand to explain her side of the story, she would have been a free woman. Again, her defence team argued the decision to refrain from speaking at the trial was all her own. Dee Dee currently resides at Lowell Correctional Institution and continues to file for appeals, change her stories and maintain her innocence. In 2019, she changed her story once more. In a handwritten letter to the judge begging for a new trial, she apologised to Abraham's mother and the prosecution for not being honest. But she took no responsibility herself, instead blaming someone else. 
She said it wasn't drug dealers that killed Abraham, but in fact, Greg Smith was the real killer. She claimed Abraham was having an affair with Greg's wife and this was the motive for the murder. For months, Dee Dee had staged events and tried to convince everyone that Abraham was alive and hiding, but ultimately, she reached a point where she couldn't keep track of her own stories. Detective Greg Thomas of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office said that in the almost two decades he's been in law enforcement, he has never met another person like Dee Dee Moore. Since being in prison, she has spoken out in many interviews, all the while protesting her innocence and giving different stories. I think people are complete idiots that think I had anything to do with it. She claims that there are witnesses who support her version that a mysterious drug dealer killed Shakespeare. This is stuff that's not in my discovery. These are witness statements. You understand These that? witnesses don't exist, and that certainly looks like your handwriting. What do you mean? The that looks like your handwriting. What you said were witnesses' notes looks like your handwriting. As she exited stage left, she threw out a name. Her first name is Deanna. I'll give you that. Abraham Shakespeare's estate won several lawsuits filed against Dee Dee Moore on behalf of Abraham's two sons, Moses and Jeremiah. The home Dee Dee claimed she bought from him was returned to his estate, and Abraham's estate also sued the Bank of America for negligently enabling Dee Dee to steal money from Abraham. Abraham's mother Elizabeth said despite everything, she has found it in her heart to forgive Dee Dee for what she did. Abraham Shakespeare was a generous and giving man. He wanted for nothing and gave almost every penny he had away. He helped the community he lived in, those he loved and those he didn't even know. He met an awful end at the hands of someone he trusted and someone he believed was helping him. But his kind-hearted and generous spirit will never be forgotten. <laughs>